Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Caitlin and I upload a whole bunch of different types of videos on this channel, mainly surrounding true crime and psychological cases, as well as a little bit of fashion and lifestyle sprinkled in where I can. Now for today's video, I'm actually doing a serial killer case, which I haven't done in a long time really. I know I don't really do serial killers much on this channel, um, but definitely let me know if you do want me to cover some, especially sort of maybe some of the lesser known ones just because I think there are so many channels out there and things that can provide fantastic videos on sort of the larger known ones. Um, like I know a lot of people have done some of the larger known cases like Ted Bundy and things and they are absolutely fantastic videos so I don't just really want to make another one of those for you guys. So if there are any sort of lesser known serial killers that you'd like me to research then please do feel free to let me know. But for today's video we're going to be discussing a serial killer known as the Candyman. His name was Dean Coral and he had a lot of victims. So I think up to this current point it's believed that there were about 28 victims spanning over just I think about three years which is absolutely insane. Um, but what kind of stands out about Dean Coral is that he actually had two accomplices who were teenage boys. So if you want to hear about this case and please keep watching I would just like to add in a little disclaimer here just because of the nature of some of the attacks and crimes that are spoken about in this video. Um, I don't really go into too much detail, I don't really go into very graphic details just because it is very upsetting and it's just not really something anyone wants to hear about but just because of the nature of the crimes they do involve young boys being assaulted and so if you don't want to hear about any form of sexual assault or or aggression then you know feel free to click off this video I don't really want to upset anyone I just thought it was fair just to give you guys a little bit of warning so with all that being said we should just jump straight into the video so if you want to hear about Dean Coral the serial killer and all of his crimes then keep on watching and we shall just get started Dean Coral was born on December 24th in the year of 1939 in a place called Fort Wayne in Indiana as a child he experienced quite a lot of unrest in his home life because his parents Arnold and Mary were known to have a rather unhappy marriage and he witnessed them having quite severe arguments regularly. The couple had a second son, this time naming him Stanley, and when Stanley was just four years old they decided to get a divorce. Dean and his younger brother were still young when his father was drafted into the Air Force and shortly after his mother decided to move all three of them over to Memphis in Tennessee to make it still possible for them to remain in regular contact with their father. And in general, Dean was considered to be quite a quiet child with a tendency to be very shy. He was often referred to from a young age as being a very serious child and he didn't react the same way as a typical child his age would to a lot of situations. When he was seven years old, he suffered from a spout of rheumatic fever, which affects a number of areas within the body. However, this at the time had gone unnoticed and undiagnosed until a short while down the line when it was discovered that the boy had developed a heart murmur and as a result they'd put the cause down to being untreated rheumatic fever. As a result, Dean was instructed that he wasn't able to take part in any activity that would you know, put strain on his body, in particular his heart and his lungs, and this meant that from a young age he was unable to take part in things that typical young boys would enjoy, like sports. And then, four years after Arnold and Mary had gotten a divorce, the pair actually rekindled their love shortly after the end of World War II, and they were soon remarried. The family once again reunited as a whole family unit then decided to up and move to Texas. Dean was still quite young at this point, but arguably old enough to be aware of what was going on in his family life, and no doubt it was quite a confusing period of time during his childhood. Shortly after his parents' remarriage, it became very clear that the relationship Dean and his father had would not be a particularly stable or positive one. His father had a tendency to not openly show much love or affection towards either of his children, but it soon worsened when he began responding to them as though they disgusted him. It gotten to a point where punishments for minor things like bad behaviour would be extremely severe and aggressive on their father's behalf. And a few years later, Dean's parents decided once again to separate as their second attempt at marriage clearly wasn't a successful one. As a result of this, Dean's mother would be forced into working grueling shifts and long hours just to make sure that she could continue supporting her children and due to their father not really being stable or a constant figure in their life, Dean and his younger brother spent most of their days in the care of various babysitters. 
Mary soon found herself a new relationship with a salesman named Jake West, and before long these two were married and he became a stepfather to the boys. And then in 1955, the four of them had all moved into a home together, and Mary and Jake welcomed their daughter Joyce into the world. Jake and Mary then decided that they wanted to open up a business together to support their three kids, and their business of choice was to make and sell candy. During the growth of their business, their two sons would regularly help out with different tasks as they were kind of teenagers by this point. So they would go to school in the daytime, come home and then spend their evenings helping out with the business. The boys were primarily in charge of making the candy itself and operating the machines, as well as ensuring that it was all packaged correctly, while it was Jake's job to use his previously developed salesman skills to actually go out and sell everything. Dean graduated high school in the year of 1958 with little to no blemishes on his record, he didn't really show any signs of bad behaviour in his time as a student, and his grades overall were relatively average. It's believed that he didn't really spend much time socialising and he didn't really have a very large or close group of friends. And some sources said that throughout his years as a student, he had the odd few girlfriends, but mostly he just kept to himself. It's known though that he did dedicate a large portion of his time to being in the brass band at school as he was an avid trombone player. And then him and his family actually decided to move to Houston in Texas where their candy business would end up thriving, to the point where their success meant that they were able to open up their own candy store. And two years later, Dean's mother had asked him to move to Indiana where his elderly widowed grandmother needed someone to care for her full time. Since Dean was the eldest child, he fulfilled her request and it was actually here that he met a woman living in the local area and the pair had began dating. Their relationship ended in the year of 1962 when this woman had actually proposed to Dean, but he had rejected her offer and moved back to Houston to help out with the candy store once again. Back at the family home, Mary and Jake's marriage was facing some trouble and in 1963, the pair were divorced. From here, Mary decided that she had actually learnt enough from her years of running the candy business that she would be able to open up her own away from her ex-husband, with Dean's role in the business being vice president. In order to grow their business, they decided to begin recruiting for other employees to help out with the running of the candy production, as it would be a relatively difficult task for just the three of them to take on themselves. And amongst the new round of recruitment, they'd hired a teenage boy from the local area to help out. They didn't really face any issues until this teenage boy had began to make complaints about Dean making sexual advances towards him. Since he had gone to Mary with these complaints, he had simply intended on Mary asking Dean to refrain from making these unwarranted advances towards the boy, but sadly, rather than doing so, Mary actually decided to terminate the young boy's employment. The following year, Dean was in his mid-twenties and he was drafted into the US Army and was sent to Louisiana to complete his training despite his heart condition and then to Georgia before permanently settling in Texas. And it's believed that somewhere around this point in his life, he began to experience his first encounters with other men and started coming to the realisation that he was homosexual. Dean's family and acquaintances had allegedly had their suspicions that he was in fact homosexual, although he had never openly admitted so, as they had noticed that when he was in the company of men, in particular teenage boys, he would act ever so slightly different, only enough for them to be able to notice. And before long, Dean applied for a hardship discharge from the army, claiming that he needed to go back home and help his mother out with the running of the business. This request was granted and in 1965 he was honourably discharged, meaning that he could move back home after just 10 months of training. He returned back to his vice president position in the company and a few months later the company relocated to a new building, now opposite a school. Dean soon began spending his days giving out free candy to students in and around the school, particularly the teenage boys, and the local children soon gave him his own nicknames. Sometimes he was referred to as the Candy Man and sometimes the Pied Piper. And the latter obviously comes from the story of the Pied Piper, a man who had lured rats away from an infested town where they would drown nearby. And this nickname would become fitting for Dean as he soon developed his MO for his crimes. He would use the prospect of free candy to lure away teenage boys and eventually sexually assault them. He'd also chosen to put up a pool table at the rear of the property behind the business with the intention of local men and boys using it as a way to hang out and socialise. 
And then in the year of 1967, Dean had developed a close relationship with a 12 year old local boy named David Owen Brooks after meeting when he was one of the children that Dean would hand out free candy to. He'd also allegedly started hosting parties at his apartment in Pasadena, Houston, where he would invite local boys around to encourage them to spend their free time sniffing glue and paint with him. So this is pretty much where he was able to spend so much time with these local boys, in particular David Brooks. Dean and David Brooks specifically had spent a significant portion of time together, whether it be in Dean's apartment or around the pool table outside the factory. The pair would even go on trips together with other boys from the area. And Dean had began to paint himself as kind of like a father figure in David's life. He spent time with him and he gave him money if he needed anything and David had trusted him with a lot of his secrets and problems. But as I'm sure you can imagine, Dean's intentions with the young boy hadn't been so pure. Over time, Dean would slowly attempt to urge him to engage in sexual acts, and in 1965, the pair's relationship had escalated to being sexual in nature, often with Dean bribing the boy to let him perform sexual acts on it. And at this point, Dean was 30 years old and David Brooks was just 14 years old. Behind the scenes of the candy business, they were facing some severe financial troubles, and around this time, Mary was forced to shut the business permanently, and this meant that Dean was hereby unemployed. But he soon managed to get himself a job as an electrician to maintain his lifestyle. Mary then decided to move away to Colorado with her daughter, who was obviously Dean's stepsister, and he managed to remain in relatively regular contact with his mother, but from this point on, the pair never actually saw each other again. At some point over the years, Dean had developed a form of fantasy towards not only younger boys, but particular acts of aggression and torture, with them being the victims. So it's believed that his first murder had actually occurred in the year of 1970, with his victim being Jeffrey Conan. Jeffrey Conan was 19 years old at the time and studying at the University of Texas. On the 25th of September 1970, Jeffrey had been hitchhiking from the university campus with the intention of getting himself a ride back to his parents' house in Houston, but he disappeared. It's believed that Dean had passed the boy while driving and he'd lured him back to his home on the pretense that he would give him a lift to his parents' house. When he managed to get the boy inside the property, he'd strapped him to a board that he'd constructed as a means of torture and restraint before sexually assaulting him and strangling him until he was no longer alive. And Dean later buried his body in a nearby beach in Texas. There was allegedly an incident shortly after him committing his first attack that involved David Brooks walking into Dean's apartment as he normally would, but he'd entered and witnessed Dean without any clothes on standing over two undressed boys that had been tied to his homemade torture rack. David claimed that upon noticing what had happened when he'd walked in, he jumped away from the boys and said to him, I'm just having some fun. Dean then proceeded to offer to buy David a car in exchange for not telling anyone what he'd seen, and considering David was just 15 years old at this time, and Dean had spent so much time giving him this sort of trust and grooming him, David agreed to keep it a secret. It's said that when David walked away from the incident that he'd witnessed that day in Dean's apartment, he'd assumed that after being caught, Dean was just going to release the two boys and they were going to move on from it. However, this wasn't the case. It was later learned that Dean actually killed the two boys once David had left the apartment and buried the remains. Dean now realised that he had an opportunity to use David as an accomplice in his crimes, as David had shown his level of trust and loyalty since he didn't say anything about what he'd seen that day, and from here on out he used David as a means of finding and bringing boys to him for him to assault in exchange for money. He told David that for each boy he could bring back to him, he would give him $200, and this wasn't something that David could refuse. And then, after gaining an accomplice, Dean committed his next attack on the 13th of December 1970. David Brooks had come across two young boys, 14-year-old James Glass and 15-year-old David Danny Yates, to bring to Dean. He'd spotted them out in public at a religious rally, but after talking to them, he managed to get them to go to Dean's apartment. David was allegedly already familiar with James Glass, as some sources say they'd been close friends, while others say that they'd kind of just been acquaintances and known each other from around the local area, but either way, he had been familiar enough to go up and talk to them. Once inside Dean's apartment, they were strapped to Dean's constructed torture rack and sexually assaulted before being strangled. Dean had buried their remains in a boat shed that he'd recently started renting, so it was unlikely for the bodies to be discovered anytime soon. Less than two months later, 
Dean then claimed the lives of two more young boys, this time two brothers named Donald, who was 15, and Jerry Waldrop, who was 13. The boys had been walking to their home when Dean and David had passed them in the van that Dean was driving. Somehow they'd managed to lure the young boys into the van and from here he took them back to his apartment and here they were once again tortured, assaulted and strangled. And these victims were two buried in Dean's rented boat shed. The murder spree continued with each of the victims experiencing the same things at the hands of Dean Coral. Between the months of March and May, Dean had assaulted and killed three more boys all aged between 13 and 16 years old, with the first of them being 15 year old Randall Harvey. The two following victims, David Hillegeist who was 13 and Gregory Malley Winkle who was 16, had had a huge search party sent out in hopes of locating the boys as their parents had been adamant on returning them home safely. A local boy named Elmer Wayne Henley had been a close friend of David Hilligeist and he'd volunteered himself to hang up posters around the local area which were offering a reward for information leading to the discovery of the two boys. Now the name of this local boy would become uh, relevant in the case once again later on in the video so it's worth remembering. On August the 17th, 1971, Dean and David had been out when they'd come across a friend of David's, a 17-year-old named Reuben Watson. He had just been to the movie theatre in Houston and he decided to start his walk back home. When the pair started speaking to him, they had told him that Dean was hosting a party at his apartment and persuaded him to attend, and so they drove him to the apartment where he was tortured and strangled, and Reuben's remains were too buried in Dean's boat shed. A few months later, David had managed to lure 15-year-old Elmer Wayne Henley, the friend of one of the previous victims, to Dean's apartment. Initially, he had been lured there as one of the next victims, but Dean had actually decided that he could use him as another accomplice, just like David Brooks. And just as he did with David, he offered Wayne $200 every time he could bring a young boy back to his apartment. When Wayne began asking questions, Dean had actually informed him that he was doing so as he was involved in a sex slavery ring originating in Dallas and that he was just working to find young boys himself to sell to them. And Wayne agreed to take part once he realised that he needed the money and he began to aid Dean and David in the search and abduction of a number of the next victims. However, what's particularly concerning is that before long, Wayne actually began to show a significant difference to David. He actually began to actively take part in the killings of some of the victims. It's believed that the first victim that Wayne had lured was 17-year-old Willard Branch. He had been spotted one day when Wayne and Dean had been out driving and they lured him back to the apartment by giving him the impression that they were going there to get high. His remains were later found buried in the boat shed and according to Wayne, he disappeared on the 9th of February 1972. According to Wayne, when they'd gotten back to the apartment, he'd been messing around with a pair of handcuffs and he was showing the boy how he could put these handcuffs on himself and then free himself easily using the key. He managed to convince Willard to do the same thing, you know, kind of mess about just because he'd been shown that it was really easy to get out of them. But once he had handcuffed himself, Dean had sprung on him and gagged him and tied him up. Wayne left the young boy alone with Dean as he'd obviously been under the impression that he was just luring boys to the apartment to then be transported to Dallas where they would then be sold into a sex slavery ring. But obviously this wasn't Dean's intention and he assaulted and killed the boy. The following month, on March the 24th, 1972, Dean and his two accomplices had come across a friend of Wayne's, 18-year-old Frank Anthony Aguirre. He had just finished working a shift in a local restaurant when he'd started heading towards his car to begin his drive home, but the three pulled up in Dean's van and they invited him to Dean's apartment where they were all going to drink beer and get high. He decided to take them up on their offer, but since he had his car on him, he told them that he would follow the van back to the apartment. When the four of them arrived, they gave Frank some marijuana to smoke and, just like the previous victim, convinced him to handcuff himself. Dean once again bound and gagged this victim and the pair were left alone. According to Wayne, at a later point, he had actually walked in to find Dean torturing the boy and Dean had then come clean as to what his true intentions were and all the previous victims, what happened with everyone and that there was no sex slavery ring. Dean paid him the money that he said he would, but Wayne actually decided to continue helping him with his crimes and the three of them buried these sets of remains on High Island Beach. And it was from this point on, once he'd learned the true intentions of Dean, that Wayne had actually began to actively participate in some of the crimes. 
On April the 20th, 1972, Wayne and Dean abducted another friend of Wayne's, this time 17-year-old Mark Scott. This time, however, he was not lured to the apartment, but rather they grabbed him by force. Mark Scott had fought hard against the pair and tried to fight back as they tied him down to the torture board, but when he saw Wayne pull out a gun and point it towards him, he just stopped fighting back. As with the previous victims, he was tortured, assaulted and strangled and then buried on High Island Beach. David Brooks at a later point spoke about Wayne Henley and how he was at this point. He described him as being extremely sadistic in the way he participated in each of the attacks from this point on and he wasn't acting at all like he felt like he had to, it was as though he wanted to. The next victims that the three abducted were 17-year-old Billy Balch and 16-year-old Johnny Delo. When inside the apartment, these two boys were tied down to Dean's bed and Wayne had actually strangled Billy Balch himself. He then shouted, hey Johnny, towards Johnny Delone before shooting him in the forehead and then strangling him as well. They had also lured a 19-year-old boy named Billy Riddinger to the apartment around the same time where Dean had assaulted and tortured him. According to David Brooks, he had tried to convince him to release Billy and he was allowed to leave. There was also allegedly another incident that saw David Brooks himself being a victim to Dean's assault. One day, as he'd entered the property, Dean had knocked him unconscious and tied him to the bed where he assaulted him a number of times. He was soon released, but strangely, Brooks still continued on assisting him with each of the attacks. On June the 26th, 1972, Dean moved from this property to an apartment at Westcott Towers. It's known that here the three of them abducted and killed four more victims. The first had been 17-year-old Stephen Sickman on July the 20th, followed by a pair of teenage boys on October the 3rd named Wally J. Simino and Richard Hembry, and then 19-year-old Richard Kepner on November the 12th. And then on January the 20th, 1973, Dean then moved to a new property in Spring Branch in Houston. He had not been there two weeks when they'd abducted 17-year-old Joseph Lyles. He too was assaulted and killed. Dean shortly moved once again to 2020 Lamar Drive in Pasadena on March the 7th, 1973, where no known victims were killed for the first four months. It was later discovered that around this same time, Dean had actually been suffering from some quite severe health problems, which people have offered as a kind of providing an understanding as to why he hadn't abducted any victims during this period of time. But then following this brief period without any killings, they increased dramatically. From the start of June to the start of July, they had abducted and killed three more victims, but this time burying them at Lake Sam Rayburn. The first of these victims was 15-year-old Billy Ray Lawrence, a friend of Wayne's who they had invited to go fishing with them, but this invite was simply a way for them to manage to lure him to Dean's home. Following this, on June the 15th, 20-year-old Ray Blackburn had been hitchhiking to visit his wife and his newborn child before he lost his life at the hands of Dean Coral. Then Wayne met a 15-year-old named Homer Garcia at a driving school they were both students in. He was lured to Dean's home where he was shot in the head and the chest after being assaulted and tortured. And then on July 12th, they abducted and killed 17-year-old John Sellers, who they then buried at High Island Beach. In a strange twist in the timeline, in July of 1973, David Brooks actually gets married to a woman who also happens to be carrying his child. As a result, Dean relies much more on Wayne Henley to aid him in the abduction of more victims. The pair of them alone then abduct and kill three more young boys, all aged between 15 and 18 years old, just between July the 19th and July the 25th. The first of these had been 15-year-old Michael Tony Balch, the younger brother of previous victim Billy Balch, followed by 18-year-old Marty Jones and his 17-year-old friend Charles Cobble. The first of the victims was buried at Lake Sam Rayburn, while the other two were buried in the boat shed that Dean rented. Dean, Wayne and David had come across a 13-year-old boy named James Dramala. The boy had been out riding his bike when they'd pulled up to him and convinced him to go back to Dean's apartment. The young boy was tortured, assaulted and strangled before they buried him in the boat shed. And James Dramala would actually end up being the final victim of Dean Coral and his accomplices. On August the 7th, 1973, Wayne Henley had invited a 19-year-old named Timothy Cordell Curley to a party they were allegedly throwing at Dean's house. 
The boy had accepted the invite, and when he had arrived at the house with Wayne, the pair sniffed paint fumes and got drunk before leaving the home to go out and buy some sandwiches around midnight. Timothy Curley had been driving and the pair headed to Houston Heights and they'd parked not far from Wayne's house. While they were here, they came across a 15-year-old girl named Rhonda Williams who had just left her home after her drunken father had beaten her badly. As a result, Wayne decided to invite her to stay at Dean's home for the night and she climbed in the back of Timothy Curley's car. The three of them headed back to the house and they arrived at around 3am on August the 8th. When Wayne pulled up with the next intended victim and an additional young girl, Dean had been enraged at him bringing Rhonda Williams as this would completely ruin their plans. He explained to Dean that she had been hurt by her drunken father that evening and she wanted to leave the house until he'd sobered up and eventually Dean calmed down. He'd welcomed his guests by supplying them with beer and marijuana and just after two hours, the three teenagers had all passed out and under Dean's supervision. And when Wayne had woken up just a few hours later, he was being handcuffed by Dean. He'd looked down to find his ankles bound and both Timothy and Rhonda were lying face down next to him, bound and gagged. Rhonda still had her clothes on, but Timothy did not. At this point, Dean told Wayne that he was furious with him for bringing a young girl back to his home and he was going to continue to torture and assault Timothy before killing all three of them. He then proceeded to kick Rhonda in the chest multiple times before dragging Wayne into the kitchen and threatening to shoot him in the stomach. Wayne spoke to Dean, attempting to calm him down, and he promised him that if he released him, he would actively participate in the assault and murder of both of the two other victims. Dean actually agreed to untie his accomplice before tying the other two victims on either side of his torture board. Dean handed Wayne a knife and instructed him to cut off Rhonda's clothes while he continued to assault Timothy and Wayne was to do the same to Rhonda. The two victims had become conscious by this point and as Dean began to assault Timothy, Wayne actually removed Rhonda's gag. She asked him, is this for real? And he replied with yes. She then looked at him and said, are you going to do anything about it? Wayne then asked Dean if he could take Rhonda into a different room, but Dean ignored him. He then grabbed Dean's pistol, pointed it at him and said, you've gone far enough, Dean. Dean headed towards him saying, kill me, Wayne, and he started backing up, but Dean then continued just walking straight towards him, shouting, you won't do it. But then Wayne fired a shot at Dean, hitting him in the forehead. Dean lunged at the boy, but Wayne shot two more chimes, injuring him in the shoulder. Dean had turned and attempted to stumble out the room, but Wayne fired three more shots into his lower back and his shoulder. As a result of his injuries, Dean Coral fell to the floor and died on spot, unclothed and facing a wall. Wayne then headed back to the two tied up victims. He released them, helped them get dressed, and then they began to frantically discuss what they needed to do next. Wayne initially said that the three of them should just leave the house without a word, but Timothy Curley had actually said that they should call the police just to explain what happened, and this is exactly what they did. Pasadena Police Department received a call at 8.24am on August the 8th, 1973 from Wayne Henley. When the operator answered, Wayne said, y'all better come here right now, I just killed a man. He gave them the address and hung up and the three teenagers waited outside for the police to arrive. When officers arrived at the house, they placed the three of them in the back of a patrol car and took the pistol from the driveway. An officer headed inside the property and found Dean Coral's body in the hallway and immediately headed out to place Wayne Henley under arrest. As he was reading him his rights, Wayne shouted, I don't care who knows about it, I have to get it off my chest. While Wayne Henley was in police custody, he confessed to everything that had occurred over the past three years. He admitted to assisting Dean Coral in a number of abductions and murders of young boys, and he informed them of each of the burial sites that they'd use. Initially, the police had been relatively skeptical over his claims, but he'd been insistent that he was telling the truth. After he was able to provide them with specific names for some of the victims, the police started to believe his claims. The search of Dean Coral's property also led them to the discovery of a torture rack that he'd created and a number of weapons used to torture each of the victims. When officers searched the Ford van parked in Dean Coral's driveway, they found the rear windows to be covered by opaque curtains and there was a large coil of rope, a beige rug covered in mud stains, and a large wooden crate with holes drilled in the sides, which they'd assumed had been drilled in as air holes. There were rings and hooks fitted along the walls inside the van and they'd found a number of human hairs. 
The police headed to the boat shed Dean Coral rented in company of Wayne, and they'd found a stripped car, a child's bike, and a box full of boys' clothing. As they began to dig down below the ground inside the shed, they'd come across the body of a young blonde boy covered in plastic. He had been buried under a layer of lime beneath the ground, and they continued to dig, which meant that they were just uncovering more and more victims. They'd found the victims had either been shot or strangled, and they'd all shown signs of sexual abuse and torture. Their search of the boat shed ended on August the 8th, 1973, and they uncovered a total of eight sets of human remains under the ground. That evening, David Brooks and his father arrived at the police station with the intention of providing a statement denying David having any involvement in any of the crimes. But once he was there, David Brooks actually ended up admitting to having knowledge of Dean having assaulted and killed two young boys in 1970. The following day, Wayne accompanied the police to Lake Sam Rayburn as he'd said that they would find the remains of four boys there, but they ended up discovering a total of two buried in shallow graves. And then that same day, a second search of the boat shed led to the discovery of nine more sets of remains. And before long, David Brooks ended up admitting to everything, to having assisted in the abduction of the victims, as well as being present in some of the killings and as aiding the burials, but he remained adamant that he did not have any direct involvement in the killings themselves. David agreed to go with the police to the final burial site, which was High Island Beach, to dig up the remaining victims. The following day, a second search of Lake Sam Rayburn was conducted, this time finding the remaining two victims. Both the accomplices then took officers to High Island Beach where they initially found two shallow graves with two sets of remains. Three days later, a second search was conducted where they found four more sets of remains. And at this point, on August the 13th, 1973, there were a total of 27 known victims. Law enforcement soon came to realise that this was the largest and the worst killing spree that had occurred in America up to that point, and Wayne still insisted that there were four more bodies that remained buried, two in the boat shed and two at High Island Beach. Law enforcement immediately began the difficult task of identifying each of the victims that they dug up, and by April of 1974, they had managed to identify a total of 21 of the boys. In total, according to the accounts of David Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley, it's believed that there were at least 28 victims between 1970 and 1973. Over the years, there have been numerous potential identifications of sets of remains that are strongly to believe to be more victims of Dean Corals, but as of currently, these are the only known victims. Elmer Wayne Henley and David Owen Brooks faced separate trials for their individual involvements in each of the attacks. On July the 1st, 1974, Wayne was charged with six murders carried out between March of 1972 and July of 1973. There was a significant amount of incriminating evidence against him, including Billy Ridinger, who had been tortured by Dean or being released by David Brooks. And then, on July the 16th, he was sentenced to six consecutive 99-year sentences, one for each murder that he was charged with. He had attempted to appeal his sentencing and was given a retrial in December of 1978, but he was once again sentenced to the same six consecutive 99-year sentences. David Brooks's trial began on February 27th, 1975, and he was indicted of four murders occurring between December of 1970 and June of 1973. However, when he was taken to trial, he was actually only charged with one murder, the murder of Billy Ray Lawrence in 1973, and the argument was heavily made that he didn't have any involvement in the actual murders themselves, simply bringing the victim to, to Dean and Wayne as opposed to actually having a hand in the deaths. The trial didn't even last a week, and the jury's deliberation process was only 90 minutes long, following which David Brooks was found guilty of Billy Ray Lawrence's murder, and on March the 4th, 1975, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. He also appealed his sentence under the claims that the signed confessions gained by law enforcement had been taken without having been informed of his legal rights, but his appeal was ultimately denied and both Wayne and David remain in prison to this day. I think it's absolutely heartbreaking, the entire thing. It's so awful what happened to each of these young boys, um, how each of them lost their life. It's absolutely dreadful. And I think a lot of you will agree with me, well, I hope you'll all agree with me, that I feel a sense of peace knowing that something has come about as a result in terms of the people responsible have all been punished. Apologies for the complete change in appearance. Um, it's actually a couple days later, my camera ran out of storage. So uh, yes, I'm filming the rest of the video looking completely different. I apologize if that's a little bit distracting, 
But continuing on with the case, in 2011, another victim of Dean Calls was identified. By this point, there were two victims that had yet to be named, but this particular victim had been identified as Roy Eugene Bunton, a boy who'd been around 17 years old when he disappeared in the year of 1971. Initially, his remains had actually been misidentified as another one of the victims, Michael Balch, but when DNA tests were carried out later on in the investigation, so sort of in these later years, the mix-up was discovered. In the year that he'd gone missing, Roy had left his home heading out to start his shift at a shoe store in the Houston Northwest Mall, but he'd never made it home. The remaining unidentified victim that was found in one of the three burial sites was believed to have died between the years of 1972 and 1973. He was placed at being somewhere between the ages of 15 and 19 years old, and he was wearing a khaki long sleeve shirt with a peace sign printed on it, dark blue corduroy trousers, multicolour swimming trunks and boots. He'd also had I believed a tattoo, there was a mix up of sources, there's not a lot of information, um, but some people have speculated that there was kind of a significant tattoo on the victim, but this tattoo, if there is one, hadn't really led to anywhere. In more recent years, it has been speculated that the identity of this particular victim is possibly a boy named Bobby French, who was a young boy thought to have gone missing around the same time as this boy had died. There is not a lot of information that I could find on Bobby French's disappearance, but a lot of speculation has come about as a result of people kind of comparing reconstructed image of the unidentified victim and the image of Bobby French. This identification, however, is not positive and the victim remains unidentified to this day, as well as Bobby French's case remaining unsolved to my knowledge. So that is everything I'm going to discuss today on the case of Dean Coral and all of his victims. I hope you guys found this interesting. Let me know if there are any other maybe lesser known serial killers, like I said, that you'd like me to research. I can definitely do that for you guys. I hope you're all staying safe and positive and I will see you guys very, very soon for another video. Thanks for watching. Bye.